the, the session. Here we go. All right. So the schedule for events uh, for this semester is that we're now in week four. So we're going to do day cleanup. Next week is presentations. And then uh, we'll get to automation reports after that. Uh, a few of you have emailed me on the homeworks asking questions. And for those of you who did, I tried to respond as quickly as possible to answer those questions. But I uh, have a harder time helping people who do not ask questions. So this slide is to emphasize the point that if you're confused, you don't understand the assignment, or you don't understand a technical issue within the assignment, and you're stuck, then you should uh, seek guidance, uh, either from me or from the tutor for 601, Kavita. She's also available. All right. The, the whole idea of data cleanup is a really broad issue that I think I, I feel is underrepresented in data science. So I'm going to cover a lot tonight. And these slides will be available in Blackboard for your reference. But there's a lot to be done in this area. And it, it's, it's a very subjective process with not a lot of math involved. And so it doesn't have sort of the, the, the fame and glory of machine learning, but it's at least as hard, if not harder. Most of your time spent in data science will probably be in data cleanup or in, and getting data. So all the things that I walk through, there's no special order. Like you'll be doing every step all the time on your data, and there's not like a prescribed method of the madness. Um, the value in, in doing data cleanup is that you have a really good understanding of what is in your data before you even start doing machine learning or other fancy analysis. Just by cleaning the data, you can start to realize, oh, there's a question here that would be interesting to answer. So when someone hands you a pile of data, you typically don't just you know, get started uh, on doing the analysis. You have to first clean it, and that's a very helpful process. All right, let's see if I got any questions. No, nope, good. All right, so what I am hoping to impart to you this evening is some uh, semblance of there are these things called sanity checks to so sort of like uh, validate whether or not your data is any, even meaningful. And then uh, we'll have a, a recurring issue of missing data. Your data will not always be fully populated with all the values that you're looking for. And so we'll have to deal with that. And then uh, you'll invariably run across outliers in your, in your data that don't seem to fit the trend that you expected. And so how do you handle those? So one trap that's very easy to fall into for new data scientists is to like be handed a pile of data and then like start working away at it and, and thinking that they're doing good work just because they're doing work. Uh, but that does not imply that the work is relevant to what your customer wants. And so just to reemphasize, even while cleaning the data, it's important to check in with your customer and say, hey, I started out with this dirty data and I did some transformations to make it a little bit cleaner. Is this sensical to you? Is it making? Is it adding? Is it going to add value? Right, and, and that's the question you want to keep asking your customer all the time, even before you do analysis. You say, "I have this data. I spent two weeks cleaning it up. Were those two weeks well invested?" Right? Because the customer is waiting for a product. Uh, <laughs> this is a lesson I have to learn over and over: is that. Just because you have data does not mean that it is the truth. It does not mean that it was collected correctly. Um, and so there, there's always this, you should be suspicious of your data. Right? Like, um, make sure that you know how did it get generated, who's responsible for generating it, and uh, you know, how, trustworthy, how trustworthy is that person or team? How, how, long, how much of your work would you like to invest before realizing that there's a mistake with someone else's way they collect the or generated the data. Uh, so that's that's a, a lesson that I have to keep learning over and over, because I'll go off and I'll make some analysis, and I'll think, oh, this is a really cool analysis. Like I spent you know, a couple of weeks doing this analysis. And then someone will point out, well, that analysis couldn't possibly be true, because you know this little observation in the data doesn't hold up. And then I'll go back and, and figure out, oh, the, the bug that was present was before I even got the data, someone else had collected it wrong. And therefore, my analysis, while still correct, 
is invalid because of the, the bug that occurred before I even got the data. So <laughs> we've already covered quite a bit. Uh, according to this slide, it's only 11 slides. So the other slides are a little bit more meaty. All right, a few of you have already encountered this uh, trouble of having data that isn't sort of recognizable, right? It has some, some gobbledygook that is uh, not intended for humans. And you're like, how did that get there? So there's a couple of possibilities, right? It's either that the file was exactly as the author intended it and they're you know, not the same species as you are, or maybe the data is uh, corrupted, or maybe it was some way of processing the data was incorrect. So uh, commonly, these, these things that look like gobbledygook are actually real text, but they're just encoded in a way that um, doesn't render them correctly. So we'll get into what encoding and rendering refers to here in the slide. Quick question, has, I'm gonna go back to Blackboard and ask, um, raise your hand if you've seen this issue um, previously, the idea of poorly encoded data Something that looks like this has so raise your hand in Blackboard if you've seen that issue. Mm, let's go back. All right, so half the class, yeah, or more, quite a few people. So thank you very much for participating in that. That means I'm not speaking, you know, to myself. It indicates that this is an actual problem that roughly half the class has either seen before or has some familiarity with. This is an issue, right? So let's figure out what is the root cause here. But it is possible to render that data correctly. It's just not in the way that you're expecting. And the underlying root cause for that is because computers store things on their hard drive or in memory as ones and zeros, but we want to consume that typically as text or images. And so the way that we do that um, is merely a convention. So there's no rules, it's just sort of like everyone agrees to do it in a certain way. So whether this 1001, you know, whether that thing means A or some Chinese character is totally dependent on, on who you're communicating with. So I, again, everything convention is sort of set by history, right? And, and so the <laughs> Americans, because they were working on computers, came up with the American standard code for the exchange data. And not surprisingly, we assume as Americans that A and B and C and D and E and F are all characters that are you know, useful to us. And we typically wouldn't use a Japanese character in English text. And so we are motivated to use symbols that make sense to us. And um, we set that standard and we'll call it ASCII. And this ASCII, like, why not encode every single character in, in existence, right? It's because the size matters. The, if you're taking up more characters to represent, so more ones and zeros to represent the same letter, then you're wasting space. And so this was like the most concise representation that we could come up with. So when computers get used by other people, those aren't sufficient, and therefore we have to move into more uh, a lot less concise representations of, of data. And so they're like the, the granddaddy of them all is Unicode. Right? Unicode, you can you have to store the symbols in a larger number of bytes, but you get more characters. And that's a good thing if you want to have more expressive languages. And this is a, a significant use of space on your in your hard drive or your memory. And so there's sort of intermediate representations called UTF. And so it's a little bit more compact than Unicode, but it's uh, a little bit more than ASCII. So there's different UTF options depending on what languages you're going to be in. So all of this sounds very down low in the weeds, right, as a data scientist. 
And you're like, I don't care about all the like computer stuff, right? But it's gonna bite you if it hasn't already. And and the reason for that is because you're gonna be looking at data and you won't know which convention other people are using for their data. So that'll be uh, then work for you to figure out, you know, are they using ASCII? Are they using Unicode? Are they using UTF? You know, what is the what is the data arriving to me? What form is it in? And so <laughs> this this picture here is to point out that like every single time that a developer encounters this issue, they're like, wait a minute, there are people who aren't Americans. <laughs> like that, that's a recurring issue. Um, so I would just, these are good essays on like, you know, the rediscovery of the fact that there are people who do not use A and B and C and D in their alphabet. So Pandas, the library that we're going to be using extensively this semester, uses a, uh, uh, it has the ability to figure out uh, which encoding the file is when you read that file. And so if you say, this should be Latin 1 encoding, and then it reads the CSV in that format. So that's, that's sort of handy if you already know what uh, encoding you're going to be using for your files. But we'll jump over to an example here where we can actually detect in a given file what the character type is. So I'm going to jump over to a, a Jupyter notebook. Let's see if there's anybody in the game has said anything yet. Yeah, okay. So this is a library called Chardet right, for character detection. And so let's make this a little bigger. So I'm just going to run through this notebook and And so it's going to import the library, open uh, a CSV using RB, so read binary is what that stands for in the file open command. And then we're going to have a, a file object here, the variable is fraw, and we're going to read that into a variable called file content. So now file content contains this binary string of characters. And the question is, what is the encoding? And so we, we can pass that variable containing binary data to Charda, and then it tells us, I think this is ASCII, and my confidence on a scale of 0 to 1 is 1. So it's 100% confident that that's ASCII. So that's cool. Uh, a little comment here is that if you use just the R, it's read, it'll assume that you're uh, looking at, uh, sorry, not byte. Sorry, this was byte string versus a, just a character string, not binary, sorry. So this is a character string, and so when you pass that character string to Charda, and it says, wait a minute, you passed me a string, I was expecting a byte array. So there's a little bit of explanation here on that about reading in byte versus uh, strings. So you can read on that. All these will be posted in, uh, in Blackboard after class. All right, so now using like uh, Panda's ability to specify the encoding and you've used Charta to figure out what the encoding is in the first place, um, now you've got your data in Pandas and you're like, woohoo, I can start doing analysis. And that would be a, a bad decision because before doing your analysis, you need to have a good understanding of what that data contains so that you can ask questions that are reasonable or fix flaws before your analysis discovers them. So. You don't want to write some fancy analytic and then realize that the garbage, the, the data going in is garbage. You have to spend some time characterizing your data in order to make sure that what you're feeding into your analytics is, is good data. All right. So now, so we did a little bit of data characterization in the sense of figuring out what the encoding type is, but that's, that's before we even sort of understand what's in it. So. Here, um, there's a lot of different things that we're going to take in, in in Python, but I'll primarily focus on text. Right? So it's, it'll be something like CSVs or JSON or XML. You can also process other data formats like these in Python, but that will not be our focus for this class. 
right. So what I first care about when someone says, Ben, here's some data, I ask them, is it like a megabyte, a gigabyte, terabyte, like how big is it? Right? That's like a really simple question that you should be able to answer is how big is my data? And then either it's one time, right? It's going to show up sort of an ad hoc request or it's a recurring basis of you're going to get this data every day, every week, every hour, right? And, and if it's recurring, is it schedule or event driven? Is it, you know, whenever the postman delivers the thing or is it uh, whenever I eat, right? That's an event driven action. And then things that you've already covered, um, answering how many rows and columns, if it's in a data frame type structure, um, and then what type of data is in each column. So we'll, we'll cover a little bit of this. So next up, I'm going to talk about uh, the table size and data types, but also um, some fancier ideas in Pandas. So I'm going to cover a couple different demos. If you have questions at any time, feel free to interrupt. Uh, let's see, the first one I said was going to be loan table size. Right. So I'll make sure this runs. So I'm going to load pandas. I can figure out what the version of pandas is by querying pandas underscore version. That's just when I go off and do other things, I like to know where I'm starting from with which, which version of the library. I'm going to load in this. Uh, this variable called loans2007 using a read CSV command in pandas, and it's going to give me this huge complaint. So already, like second cell in, we've already hit a problem, right? It's complaining about all of these variables have mixed types. There's all these columns have mixed types. And what that means is, is pandas is trying to guess, you know, is the column, uh, is it numeric? Is it uh, text? Is it categorical? All these different ways of storing data matter to pandas because pandas is trying to minimize how much storage or how much memory it gets used for that column. So it's making a guess and it's complaining that it can't figure out what the column type is for column zero and column one and column two. So my computer has sufficient memory that this 41 megabyte CPU. I don't really care about trying to be efficient with memory. So that's why I'm going to tell it in this, this next attempt here. I'm going to say low memory equals false. Don't try and be conservative. Just you know, go wild and, and make a bunch of guesses. And then I'm going to ask, what is the shape of this data frame once it's loaded? And it says 42,000 rows by one column. I'm like, well, that, you know, that's probably not correct. So what's going on here? Well, if you look at the head of this file, it looks really weird. I right? can't figure out what's going on here. It's really messy. And it clearly is not one column. So that, that whole report of it being shape 42,000 by one is apparently wrong. So what's going on? I'm going to look at the top of my CSV using the, the magic exclamation point, which gets me into a shell. And I'm going to run the head command, which is available in Mac and Linux, to see what my file content is. And so what I see is this string here that says, notes offered by prospectus, blah, 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 blah. So that that's, looks like my CSV, except it has this string at the top. That's because I downloaded this data from the internet. And that web page helpfully inserted a string at the top of my CSV, and that string is disrupting Panda's ability to read the CSV meaningfully. So we've got one thing in there that fixes one problem, but that there's another problem to fix. And so just to read this table in and get the size of the, the data frame, I need to do two things. Skip row one and right? ignore that string, and then also set memory to false. So finally, now I have this huge CSV and I can figure out what the shape is. So again, if I would have just trusted my, my first command there, I would have been wrong. All right. Uh, question. Okay. 
All right, so the next notebook I'm gonna walk through uses that same, all these use the same data source for the next few examples here. I'm gonna import, uh, I'm gonna restart and run all cells. These cells take a little bit of time to run. A bunch of questions. Let's see, everybody raise their hand. Is that because they have something to say? Ah, so DJ is asking, how would you do the, the head command without Mac or Linux? Mm, I think that's the question I'll have to do some research on, and I'll come back to you on that. So I will, let's see, I'm going to write that down. I'll do that. All right. Yeah, uh, to answer Daniel's question, yes, this is being recorded currently. All right. The mm, second notebook that I have here, I'm again loading in pandas, and I'm going to load this CSV. It took uh, two, uh, sorry, almost seven seconds to load the file. That takes quite a while because it's a large file. And then I want to run the command D types on that data frame to see what, for every column, what is being stored in that column. So the pandas is guessing that, um, that the, the column called ID is an object, which typically means a string, and that the, the column member ID is float64. So it's like a, a floating point number, a whole number, sorry, not a whole number, uh, a number with a decimal. And then loan amount, and it is a float64. And that, that could sort of make sense because for loan data from a bank, you expect the loan amount to be something in dollars, right? So with some decimals. So it goes through all these different sort of objects and floats. And, and then you'll see this, this, this triple dot, or the ellipsis, means that some of the records were being cut off. So this, the list of all the columns is actually too long for pandas to display it by default because there's 145 columns, right? The 42,000 rows by 145 columns, it's a lot of columns. And so pandas tries to play it safe and says, oh, I'm only gonna show you the first and the last set of them. So I'm gonna overrule pandas by giving it this command of display max rows and display max columns. And I'm gonna set that to 999. That's so just a way of like telling pandas don't hide some of the columns. I actually do want to see all of them. So 145 entries later, we're at the bottom of that list. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of D types. You typically want to check that uh, because you'll you'll rely on the the data types that are present in your data for analysis. So for instance, if one of these were a date, you want to see a date rather than an object or a float. Okay, we have a question coming in, maybe? No? Okay. Would an object always be a string? Uh, I don't actually, I have not seen cases, well, let's see. So you, you could have a, a, so this question from Travis of, will an object always be a string? I think that the object is, is like a default uh, variable type for column when, in, when pandas can't figure it out. And so, for instance, if I had a time, like let's say February 20th, 2019 at 7.38 p.m., in some sense, that is a string, but it's more appropriately a date time object, or sorry, a date time data type. And so object is just sort of this catch-all where if pandas can't guess, that's what it defaults to, and so, I'm not sure whether on the inside pandas are actually representing it as a string, but you can convert objects typically into other data types like uh, date time strings or regular strings or floats or ints or booleans. Um, okay, so back in to go a little bit deeper into that, I did hyperlink on uh, the D types command and then these types. So the the V these types links takes you to the different types of things and has a deeper description of what the different uh, 
types of variables are. Okay. Did that answer your question, Travis? So uh, the third notebook here, I'm just going to dive into quickly is the the described function and info functions. So when when you have a notebook, I think I, I'll rerun this just to make sure everything's working correctly. It's like seven seconds or so. Uh, and again, here we're applying that knowledge. I have to skip the first row and set the memory to be false. Uh, we can use the info command on a data frame. And it gives us some information about like how many different data types there are and how much memory is being used. So these are sort of like marginally useful. And it, I wouldn't say they're like you know, like the go-to thing for me, but you know that they're a way of getting some information. Okay, so let's take a look at D types there. And then uh, so some of these were floats, and these were objects. And so for the things that are for the columns that have a float we can use the describe command. So describe for each numeric column returns a bunch of different sort of statistical characterizations of that data. So count and mean and all this other good stuff. And so you can sort of scroll through here and realize like some of these, like let's say URL, right? That's typically a string. And so this is probably an instance where Canada's got something wrong. So it's reporting that the mean value URL is NAN, which sort of makes sense, right? So this was Panda's best guess was that a URL is a float, and so therefore that's why it's showing up in the describe output. But you can you can sort of recognize that oh, it was mischaracterized, so we'll have to sort of fix that later, right? So this is a quick sense of if it's returning something that doesn't make sense in this uh, great result is where more work is needed to clean up that data. All right, so I mentioned that there were float objects, the float 64, okay, and there were objects. And so there's a similar feature for, uh, so when you have a describe, it defaults to numeric data, but also a describe all, which I didn't find that useful because it actually just mashes together the the string data and the and the numeric data. So that table to me is not too useful. But this last one, it looks at the 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 types of columns that are object and describes those. And you'll see here that the the way in which those are characterized is different. So there's a number of them, right? So here there's I think there's like forty two thousand different rows. And so the fact that there are, are that many grades and subgrades is acceptable to me. But then, like, how many of them are unique, right? And what's the most frequent? And what is the frequency of that top frequent one? So this is just another way of like capturing some statistics about your your data set based on the, the types of data. All right. As I mentioned um, with that URL example some of the data types appear to be incorrect. And so what do we do then? Well, we have to fix that. We'll rerun, rerun this uh, notebook. So again, uh, we can take a look at all of the, the types. And let's take a look specifically at grade. So that's all my columns by type. And if I look at grade, this is a loan, and so my guess, this is like with without even looking at sort of like the the, the definitions of the columns, I'm gonna guess that the grade of a loan is sort of like the like how how likely is it that the person will pay off, right? So if we look at the first uh, ten rows for the grade column, we see things that make sense for a grade, right? They're a lower grade, and we can run a test on them to ask how many unique grade entries are there, and it's seven. So that sort of makes sense to us, right? Why there's an E is beyond me, but <laughs> that's a different question. And then we can ask, what are the value counts? And so how many Bs are there? So of, of these seven things, how many are each, right? There's 12,000 Bs, 10,000 As, and so forth. 
And, and this also makes sense, right? Like you're going to give a loan to people who are mostly with grade A and B, and then not so many with Fs and Gs. I don't know why there's EFG, but those are grades apparently that are acceptable in this realm. So in order to make future analysis a little easier for myself, I'm going to change the type of object from, uh, from an object into a, uh, a category type. And so here all I'm doing is I'm saying that column should be a, a type category. And then I can ask again, what is the data type of that column? And it says, oh, this is a category now because I, I forced it to be a category. So there's, we can do this with other columns too, right? Like if we look at home ownership, they're either rent or own. And if we look at the first 10 rows of that column, we see it's rent or own. And then we can say, well, how many unique entries are there in this column? There's five. So let's look at the count for five, right? So I've got, it's either a rent or own or mortgaged or other or not. So again, that sort of makes sense. So we'll force it to be categorical. And on this, this last example here, let's look at something where revolving util, right? So something with util utility probably, and then 10 column, 10 rows of that show that it's a numeric value with some percentage sign in. That character is probably what's throwing off pandas and they're forcing this into an object. So let's you know be naive and we'll we'll force it to be a float 64 because obviously this is a this is a numeric data type with a decimal so we we'll want to make it that for future reference so we can do math with it but then we see okay when we try to do that we run into this problem where it's saying i can't convert 63.5 percent to a number because pandas doesn't know what to do with that percent sign so this is where we get to play some, some now a, a, a fancier approach to, to dealing with that problem we recognize that we have to get rid of the percent sign. And so there's a string replace command that will run against this column. So we'll take the column and then we'll replace every instance of percent with nothing. And then we're going to convert that, um, that result, right? So this would be like 63.5 to a float and save that to a new column. So th this is a, uh, a thing that I, this is a preference of I don't like to overwrite data if I'm changing it. So what I mean by that is this was the original string and then I'm creating a new column rather than overwrite the old one. That's just, just a practice that I follow so that if I need to, I can recover what was the original data. So now my, my data frame after running this has additional commands, so additional columns, so I'll run this was an intentional error, so I'm going to run the rest of these. And I can look at the, the new column that I created. The first five rows are what I was hoping to get. Right? That was these values without the percent sign, and it's stored as a numeric type. So that's good. So now I'm happy. What I just showed you was sort of a diagnosis for three different columns. And you'll remember there's... 145 columns. So either that would take a lot of work or I should use Python to fix the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a new series, a pandas series, and it's going to have a, that whole list of all the, the, the series of all the types per column, right? That's why I named the variable that. So with that variable, I can create a loop that is going to um, record or report how many unique entries there are in every column. And so you can sort of start to see here, like if there's 30,000 different entries in that column, it's probably not a categorical, categorical variable. Whereas if there's only like two unique entries, then maybe it is a categorical, categorical variable and I, I can force that change. So you can sort of like start to go down this path of figuring out if a column only has a few unique entries. What are those entries, right? And so like here there's three unique entries in ID. They're all NANDs, okay, so we'll come back to that later. This one is sort of where it gets fun, right? So like the term column has two unique entries and the first five are clearly flipping between 
36 months and 60 months. So it's like a prime candidate to figure out, okay, that should be a numeric and it, you know, it should be a 36 or 60. So humans have this like annoying thing of <laughs> trying to make their data descriptive, but in the wrong way, right? So this should be another example where it is clearly a number and it shouldn't be a string. Right? So you can just loop through all of these and say like, uh, what's going on and you know, do some analysis of your columns to figure out whether they're the right categorical type or numeric type or string. So that's a, the way of, basically the whole point of this loop was to show you that you can automate analysis of the columns, but there's still some subjectivity of like, what do I think the right thing to do is here? Right? I'll have to come back to term and change that. And it, it's, that's where a lot of your time is spent, is diagnosing what the problem is. All right, and I think I have one more uh, in this little series on loans. All right, we'll rerun this. All right, so this is uh, just to show off a, a function that I use pretty regularly, which is to, right, this will take a few seconds to run, yeah. And so along that, uh, idea of looking at the first few entries of a column to figure out like what's going on. There's a, a good refinement that I would suggest for that, which is, so I can, yeah, so this function here, it loops over every single column, tells you how many unique entries there are in the column, and then prints off the most frequent entries. Right, so that function is handy because let's look at uh, the ID column. <laughs> There's a bit of a bug there that we'll come back to. So here, let's look at the member ID is empty. So we're going to skip that one. The loan amount column has 998 unique entries of which 3,000 rows have the value $10,000. Right, 2,400 rows have the value of 12,000 and so forth. And so this is a, a quick way of looking at what are the most frequent entries in every column. And that's a, a slight improvement, right? Here we can see that, for example, with the term column, there are only two entries, and this is how frequent each of them are. So it's a very quick way of diagnosing what's going on in your, in your data. It's a slight improvement over looking at just the top few entries, right? If you're, if you're biased towards looking at uh, the top five or the top 10 rows in your data frame, you may miss some, some outliers. So this is a, a quick way of catching that using uh, this function here. Okay, I think that's, oh, one more. All right, so th this is still on characterization. Oh, let's see. So question from DJ, when you're analyzing categorical data that are misclassified as floats, how would that impact analysis? Well, so if you, uh, actually, <laughs> we will see that in the next, that's a very good question that I will try to answer in the next notebook, uh, because if you're doing mm, like a numerical analysis and you want to like a scatter plot or some plot of, of numeric data, and you're thinking that there's uh, a continuous number of entries, you'll somewhat be surprised when there's only a few, like let's say zero or one, or you know, it, it does alter the questions that you're asking and the visualizations that you make. So I'm gonna address DJ's question with this next notebook. Yeah, so I think now that I've thought about it a little bit, the, the quick answer is it alters which questions you ask of the data. All right, so I'm going to import uh, a different data set from this notebook. I'm importing pandas and matplotlib. And <laughs> as a disclaimer, I have no idea about baseball. And so I'm just going to like, you know, analyze this from the perspective of a not domain expert. So this CSV has 48 columns and 2,800 rows. And because it has 48 columns, so if I ran 
VF head, uh, you know, looking at the top of the data frame, it would show me the first five rows and the first 48 columns. And so, again, it sort of chops them off with this ellipsis. So I'm gonna do a transform of that. And so this is the first five rows represented as columns. So I can sort of give a better handle on what all the different entries are. So that's just a transpose of the output. All right, so I'm gonna pick one of these randomly. So let's look at rank, which I think. Yeah, so rank here is just this numeric value. And so I could look at it um, as a graph by running the df rank, right? That's the column. It returns a series. And I'm gonna use the plot function against that series. And so it outputs this picture, which you're like, okay, that's a pretty picture. I have no idea what it means. And you're like, uh, you know, let's let's see if we can make it a little bit more meaningful. So this time it did render, so I don't need to actually use show, but I always almost always use uh, plot show to force the function to, to display something. And you'll notice it's like almost meaningless, and that's probably because it's drawing lines between every data point. That's the default for the plot function. And so uh, if I can extract out that series as a column, it actually just has a bunch of numbers in it. And so I can plot the series index. So, you know, this is the first zeroth row, first row, second row, and this is the value in that row, the value in that row, that value in that row. So when I plot it as, uh, as a set of values not connected by a line, I can see much more clearly that these are just integer values. And, and so that's a bit more meaningful than this plot, I would argue. But at this point, um, it's probably not the most useful diagram to show for this data because the relevance of the uh, position of the rows is not probably part of the story. Right? All, th all this is saying is that there are about 2,800 rows and a scatter plot implies some sequential relation between the rows. But in this case, there's not, as far as I know. And so <coughs> a better plot to show is a histogram. So a histogram just ignores the row index and says, give me all of your values and I'll tell you how many of each of them there are. So again, because if we did the scatter plot, we sort of know that there's roughly 13 entries, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, so 13. And so we can ask, how many 13s are there? There's very few of them. Right? And how many 1s are there? Well, there's a lot of them. So that's what a histogram shows. Uh, again, I still don't know what rank is, but it's uh, this is a better visualization of that data with uh, a bit of a caveat. Right? So um, the issue here is that by default, a histogram shows 10 bins. But I happen to know that there are, are more than 10 bins, and so we're probably hiding some, some data there. If I expand the number of bins in the histogram to 100, a bunch of those bins will be empty, in which case that's why this graph sort of looks really thin, because there's nothing in the the bin for 1.2 and 1.3 and 1.4, right? All these bins are empty, and so it's just showing the bins that are populated. We happen to have a technique to figure out how many unique entries there are in a column, and so we can figure out, okay, there's 13 of them. And so that histogram looks uh, even more exciting, right? I still don't know what this data is, but I can say that at least the number of bins is appropriate for this data, and there's some sort of behavior here that maybe I should tell a story about. So I merely characterize the data in a way that I think is appropriate for it. I still don't know what the story is. Okay, so this is a, this isn't the, so then this next section is to emphasize the point that this method doesn't generalize to all things, right? So if I look at the, the column AB, which again, I have no idea what it means, there's 199 unique entries in that column. So if I say, well, we'll just 
let's use that technique that Ben showed us to say the number of bins is equal to the number of unique entries. Well, the output of that plot looks like this, and it takes a bit of time to render because there are so many bins, right? There's 1,100 lines to draw on this plot. And so this is where, again, it's a very subjective process to say, what is the right number of bins that tell the story? And you could say, well, this 100 bins is probably sufficient. It renders much more quickly. And so uh, the shape of the diagram doesn't look that different. If we drop the number of bins down to 10, the shape hasn't changed, but we're definitely losing some granularity in that in that picture, right? Like this, the slope over on this side of the chart versus the slope over on that side of the chart. You've now essentially lost that because you have too few bins. So again, what is the right number of bins in a histogram is somewhat subjective. I guess one, uh, it, it depends on what story you're trying to tell, right? If you're just trying to emphasize the fact that there are more things over here and fewer of them over here, then this plot might be enough. But if you care about the shape of that distribution, then you need to go to this chart. Um, there's some point of diminishing returns where you can try and render too many things and then you just are overwhelmed with noise. So where that is is not clear. All right, question from how does it decide which bins to drop? Uh, I'm not sure what. So where, where we were, where were we dropping bins? Is that in this diagram? You mean the? Is it rounding? Mm, there's no rounding. And you can turn on your mic if you want to speak out verbally. Uh, hi, Professor Ben. Um, well, if you're going from 100 bins to 10 bins, uh, I mean, aren't you dropping bins? Uh, no. So you're forced. So the dropping bins question. So let's say you're you're looking at 100 bins versus 10 bins for your histogram. That's just the the size of the bucket. So like, I still have the same number of data points, and so the sort of like where the boundaries are on a bucket or a bin. Are different. So let's say, uh, and this isn't quite right, but let's say I have uh, any value that falls between zero and one is in a bin, and then any value that falls between one and two is in another bin, and three and four is in a bin. And if I increase the number of bins, what that really means is my bin now goes from, say, zero to point one, and also from point one to point two, and point two to point three. And so you, you're you're making, when you increase the bin size or the bin count, then you're de decreasing the width of the bin. Um, if you can picture the number line, it's how many segments are in that, in that, uh, in that number line. Okay. Yeah, so I think to answer, so Ken, if you have a question, you can verbalize it, but um, there's no rounding involved. It's just a question of where does a data point fit into a specific bin. So there's no rounding. OK, yeah, those are very good questions, though, because like, <laughs> if you haven't seen a histogram before, you have to sort of think of a number line that spans the entire range of possible values for your data set, and then divide that up into however many segments, and that's the number of bins that we have. OK, so uh, next, uh, let's see. I think it was Travis, or let's see. Someone, maybe DJ, was asking about uh, when, you know, what difference does it make whether we have categorical or numerical? So for numerical data, it's definitely the, uh, a good starting point is a histogram. If you have uh, categorical data, then a bar graph would make more sense. So remember, we were here in the, in the histogram bins, we were taking a number line and dividing it up. For uh, ca categorical data, let's say we have um, this column of LG win. I don't, I don't know what that is, but there's only two of them. And so the two values are yes and no, which looks awfully much like a categorical type data. And like that stands out, right? And so therefore, it would make more sense to make a, a bar graph for this categorical data, where we have a yes column and a no column. 
that's not a histogram. It's just like how many yeses and how many noes. And so this is to answer the question of when to use which. Well, I'd use a bar graph for categorical and a histogram for numerical. So uh, I think that's all I have on on that point. Um, and so I'm going to take a five minute break and we'll come back at 8, 10 p.m. If you have any questions during the break, feel free to ask them either uh, verbally on the mic or with a chat. And uh, we'll come back at 8, 10 p.m.
All right, so it's 8, 10 p.m. I'm going to get started. Uh, and we'll resume by taking a look at uh, two web pages that are linked in the, in the notes. So you can take a look at those uh, on your own after class. So this, this first uh, demonstration is like I've got this huge scatter plot of data points, and that it just is practically meaningless because of the overlap of these data points. So this web page sort of walks through 10 different ways to visualize that data in, in ways that are make it slightly easier to understand, right? So like the simplest is to just crank down the dot size so that it's not so much, right? And they give the code and how to do that under each plot. So it's pretty handy. Uh, the next is to sort of set the points to be transparent. Again, uh, I question sort of like how easy this is to read, but it's still there, right? And then there's these density plots, which you can use. So it's just to give you a little idea of the different ways. Um, and you can downsample. This is a way of basically you're throwing away a certain percentage of your data to make it easier to read. And you should only do that if it retains the behavior of your original plot. Then you can mark things. You can say, like, this group is different from these other groups. And you make it very clear visually with color. Or you can be uh, even fancier with different colors. Or you could just split them off on, on totally different plots, right? Totally reasonable. Uh, again, a little bit harder to read, but it delivers the point that there are three different groups. And there's jitter plots, which uh, I haven't used myself, so I can't argue for or against them. 3D plots, always attractive, right, visually, but uh, a little bit harder to interpret meaningfully. So I, I usually recommend staying away from these, even though they're pretty to look at. And then Seaborn has these really cool uh, things where you can combine sort of like the, the earlier plots and a distribution, and it, it looks fancy. So the whole point here is just to emphasize that for a given data set, there's lots of different ways to present that data. And all the code in this uh, page is included for how these different plots are rendered. OK, so that was the point number one, is that there's different layouts. Point number two is that how you choose to deliver your data is important to the success of that. So this is a really cool graphic showing like how you can make uh, a graphic more valuable to your consumer by reducing the amount of ink spent delivering the story. And so all the little animation steps here are basically to show you what is the emphasis, right? Where is the visually should the reader's focus be? And you can see it as you walk through this example, like how important the visualization is. So this is the start. You just take away all the, the background, basically. And, and they step through this very uh, well and, and showing you, you know, there's a lot of visual distraction. And if you remove that, the story is easier to understand and it looks nicer. So again, I recommend sort of like, Thinking through why this is the point, right? it's, it's less ink is better. You have a more concise story. All right, so that was basically this was walking through the text way of analyzing data. This is a visual analysis, and there's some tips and tricks on visual analysis. Another big factor that we'll run into uh, is missing data. So a little bit of a joke for you, those of you who are in a comedic mood. All right, so Pandas has a, a very good walkthrough of how to handle missing data. To summarize the, the sort of concepts, you can try ignoring it, right? Like see if you can get away with ignoring it. That's always a, <laughs> a common approach. And then you can sort of fill it in with a best guess or fill it in with a guess based on things that are nearby or sort of interpolation from everything else. So this is a whole domain of statistics called imputation, which I'm not an expert on. So I'm, I'm going to defer the Wikipedia page on that. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated to get right. And especially, it matters more and more as you have less data. All right, so we'll walk through a little bit of, of those steps. 
with, the, with that same loan data that we were looking at earlier. And just to make sure it's still sharing, recording, and video. Yeah, okay. All right, so this is that 41 megabyte uh, CSV containing loan data. So I'm gonna run all those cells. It takes a little while to run. I'm gonna use pandas. I load it in the CSV, and then I can look at the the top six entries transposed. That's this line here. And we'll wait for that to run. Yeah. Okay. So there's the top six rows in the data frame by column. And we can sort of get a feel for all these different entries. There's a lot of them. And so uh, a quick question that we would like to ask are uh, whether there are these NAN entries, right? NAN, not a number. This is a, a thing that pandas substitutes in the, the variable NAN whenever there's a missing entry. And so if we run the is null command, pandas will report to you which fields have NAN values in them. So we're only looking at the top of that data frame again, but there's a lot of NANs. And a fun little trick to play is that even though re these return Boolean uh, results, we can run a sum command against them. And so the sum will count every entry of true as a one, and false as a zero. And so what we've done is we've basically summed all of the counts where there is a NAN value in that data frame. And some happens to default to be running uh, row wise. And so what this means is that in the ID column, there's 42,535 entries, which are NAN. That's a pretty high count, right? Because the original data frame size uh, was roughly that, I think 42,538. So already we can sort of tell that this this column has no entries except for three of them. The member ID is even worse. That column has all NANs. It's totally, entry, totally empty. The loan amount happens to have three entries that in an entire column are empty and so forth. So you look through here, there's a lot of columns that are totally empty. And so uh, reminder, we're looking at this size data frame. And so a lot of these are, are, are empty. And we can ask, well, which ones are totally empty? We can say, give me the, the count of empty rows per column. And if that is equal to the size of the number of rows, then we'll return a true. And so this is telling us which columns are totally empty and which columns have something. So if this was true, that means that the member ID has no entries. So that's sort of a fun thing to sort of detect. Oh, wow, there's a whole bunch of columns out of these 145 columns that are totally empty. <coughs> so what we'll do with that is we'll just drop all those columns, right? It doesn't make any sense to hold on to them. And so this for loop, uh, if we look at so all of the the things that we, that whole series is stored in this variable, and then what we'll uh, ask is we'll say for every entry in this series, we'll run iter items, which allows us to get both the column name that is on the left side here and the boolean variable that's in the right side. And if that Boolean variable is true, then we're going to drop that column. And so we're going to drop the entire column, and it's going to be in place. So after we run that command, then the shape of that data frame is reduced. Right? We still have the same number of rows, but now there's only 64 columns. So that's a nice drop. right? We can, we can definitely have a more manageable data set if we drop all the empty columns. OK. So we can figure out how many rows there are with the length command, and then divide the number of empty uh, uh, fields in a column by that length to get a percentage, right? So this is like 99.9929% of that column is empty. That's a pretty high ratio. 
a lot of these are a lot lower. So that's sort of interesting. And you can you can sort that, and you can see that a lot of these columns, like a few of them here, only have a few entries. So 99% of them are empty. Uh, and then, so if you sort that, then you can say, well, a whole bunch of them only have you know 0.0071% of the entries missing. If you remember, that was the 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 columns where there are only three entries that had names. So what what's it's a little bit of de detective work here. We can say, give me all of the the entries in that column where it's null, and tell me what those cell what those those uh, rows look like. And so we can see that. Just coincidentally, it turns out that the, there's some text in the ID column, and everything else is NAN. So that that data frame is telling us that these cells are all empty except for the one column. And we can verify that by doing some math. Right? The diagnosis is that three times 64 um, entries in this data frame, of which three should have content. So I can check that quickly. That's what the math is there. Um, so it's just verifying the fact that, yes, it really is the case that only those three rows in that one column have content. And then we'll drop that. Right. So the ID column probably has a mistake in it introduced by some human. Right. Loans that do not meet the credit policy is not an ID. And neither is this, and neither is that. So some human inserted the wrong column. So we'll drop that column, and then we can drop all the rows. So this command here is dropping all the rows where uh, the entire row is empty. Right. So then after that, then we've got three fewer rows and one less column. And <laughs> So we did some detective work, basically, which I think is a good thing to do. But a, a faster way of doing the same thing is just drop all the, like, start fresh, right? You know, load your data, and then just drop all the empty rows and columns. That's like a really straightforward th thing to do. And you get essentially a very similar reduction. But I would also argue a little less understanding of what happened there. So this is the, the fast, efficient method of just drop all the empty things. And it does get you results, but it doesn't tell you why they were being dropped as well. All right, the next thing that we can do to characterize our data and how and what's in it, we can look for things where all of the rows have the same value. And again, this is going to tell us that those rows probably aren't useful for analysis. So again, you can just use that same drop of if the column showed up in the list of columns that was uh, only had one entry, then we'll drop it. And then the result there is we've dropped 10 columns. So now we're only down to 54 columns. So that's cool. Now we can go back and use that function I defined earlier of looking at the unique entries per column. And now we've got some uh, a really good starting point for understanding what's in our data. We've dropped all the empty rows. We've dropped all the rows that have the same entry in them. And now we're looking at unique entries per column. So this is where uh, our, our text analysis of missing entries ends. I'm going to switch over to a different notebook that has a visual analysis of essentially something very similar. So I'm going to install the library called missing NO. So this is a, a library that allows us to visualize that data, but um, rather than doing all the text analysis. So I'm loading in the same CSV, the same shape of 140 columns. This should look familiar at this point. Got a bunch of NANs in it. Right? And then, so the library that I loaded in allows us to sort of visually inspect the density of missing em entries. So black columns mean that there is an entry, and the white columns mean that there's no value in that column. And so we're looking at 25 randomly selected entries. And so these are the row index from 1 to 25 for uh, 
645 columns. So you can make it uh, a little bit more dense and you can say, give me 250 rows and then it will sample uh, that many rows and send it to the visualization. It's larger and larger. Uh, and so if we again run that command that we ran earlier of dropping the, the ID column and dropping all the empty rows and columns and then dropping uh, rows and columns that have only one value, then we get uh, a density of entries that is much more reasonable. There's still some investigation to go on here, right? Like, what's going on with this line, right? And so, again, this isn't all 45,000 rows. This is just looking at a subset of the rows, but it points us that there are some issues resolved, but it's just another way of looking at the density of your empty values. I think that's, I mean, I'm going to check for questions. All right. All right, so, so we covered how to do analysis of your empty missing values uh, with text and then with a, a little visual library. And, and basically what we were doing was dropping all the empty rows. So that's pretty straightforward. Like that's, all right, and then if you if you want to do numeric analysis, sometimes the numerical analysis allows you to include NANs, and sometimes it does not. And so you may want to fill in that data. Uh, and I think there's the next, yeah. So so if you just have like if you want something numeric, you can fill it in with a, a known value. That's sort of a risky business because uh, it may not be realistic. A more uh, reasonable way of filling in empty values is to look at the distribution of your variable. So if you remember, we did a visualization earlier of a histogram. And so you'd want to basically figure out what that distribution of values is so that you can fill in the empty rows uh, with values from that distribution. But, and the second point here is that it, that approach assumes that you have enough data to have a meaningful distribution. And then there's a, a fancier thing that I won't cover because we're not going to use it in class of so basically interpolating ad from adjacent values. Again, that sort of assumes that the adjacent values are pertinent, and that the order matters. But in the time series, that would be the case. OK, so I just gave you a whole bunch of words and uh, there are practical applications of this um, because when you're dealing with data, there are almost always missing values. And so uh, you need to come up with creative ways of addressing this. And so Airbnb published uh, an article on their approach to dealing with some missing values. And their approach used a machine learning approach called the random forest classifier. And so uh, that was sort of like a, their novel approach to dealing with missing data using machine learning. OK, I'm going to get into a, uh, what I consider the fun section. This is on sanity checks. Um, we'll cover sanity checks, and then we'll, we'll take another break uh, before finishing up. So sanity checks to me are sort of like a hard to capture what makes sense from a machine point of view, but from a human point of view, it's very obvious, right? So for example, if in your list of goods at a grocery store, you see a candy bar listed for $132,000, it's probably not correct. Right? And, I, and I can't tell you why that is, other than to say, in my experience, most candy bars are in the range of $1 to $5, right? And so, again, this is an almost intrinsically a human issue because uh, to tell a machine what a candy bar should cost sounds reasonable, except that you have to apply it to all the things you'd ever see. And that, that, that's what makes it a human process, as far as I can tell. Please prove me wrong, right? <laughs> uh, same thing on the other end of the spectrum where a couch costing less than a penny. First off, that's an issue with the fact that you're using dollars that are less than a penny. but um, or, you know, 
financial amounts that are less than a penny. But so, so you can find either of these issues by looking at the max and min values and understanding what your product categories are and whether those make sense. So I'm going to put that on my list of, you know, as a sanity check for for your things that you're looking at, look at the max and min. And if, if those don't make sense, then you've got some problems, right? Because what this really indicates is that maybe someone put a wrong value in the wrong column, right? Maybe this was supposed to be the subtotal on all products in the, in the, in the grocery store. Like something went wrong before you got the data. And you need to hunt that down to figure out what happened. Okay, another tricky uh, problem to find is, is when you're looking at something like a bus stop and you're saying, when did the buses arrive? And if you had 28 bus arrivals and all of them arrived you know, within roughly 22 seconds of each other, that seems unlikely. And again, it's totally a human sort of diagnosis of what's reasonable. It may be reasonable that all your buses arrived within 22 seconds. But probably not, right? If we're looking at like you know a, a village of people and picking up bus stops, and you know it, whether that's reasonable or not is totally a question that depends on your data. This would be an instance where I would probably do a little bit more investigation depending on the story. Uh, and then <laughs> there are other problems that just you know may or may not make sense. But if I have a hundred different people and their ages are only decades, then <laughs> it's a very unusual group of people, right? Statistically unusual, but it could be true. It's just unlikely. And again, the appropriately sized histogram would pick this out, and a, a histogram or variance would show this also. So, so these are things where we can catch these by looking at the distribution of values and asking whether that distribution seems reasonable given the data that I'm looking at. Okay, so these are two techniques to catch anomalies, or sorry, uh, to do sanity checks. And then there's some some other sort of like data issues that are not as, uh, not, they're not Python based, they're more like how do you interpret data. So in this Excel spreadsheet I was handed, I got, <coughs> excuse me, a distance in miles, a time in horses, wait, wait a minute, that, the units there is clearly wrong. It's either, you know, uh, a, a floating point value of horses or there's some time, right? Like maybe they meant hours, but horses is clearly wrong, right? And then movies per hour, okay, maybe that makes sense, right? But like there is something wrong here. And so you should go back and just verify with your user, with the people who supply the data. Is that what you really meant? Because it looks wrong. So when you're fixing errors like this, um, my suggestion, like you'll often see sort of the, the category, the, the label for the column and then a units with that. What I like to do is like specify the units in the column in my data frame in pandas so that I can understand whether or not that makes sense. Because if I just had like speed and I didn't include the units, then I wouldn't know whether 120 were in kilometers per hour or miles per hour. So this type of thing, I try and include that in the column header for my data frame. And then there's, uh, you know, just an un endless source of these issues where we're not quite sure, like, is that even reasonable, right? Like, let's say I'm, I'm counting cows and there's 4.28 of them. Maybe that's reasonable, but most of the time not, right? Someone made a mistake and made that column's, you know, mislabeled or the values are wrong. Could be either. Um, sometimes percentages do exceed 100%. So, for instance, if my my growth of year over year is 120%, that sounds totally reasonable, right? It means it grew at 1.2, uh, factor of 1.2. But if I'm looking at a thing like a, a book and I say there's 153% of the chapters in a book, well, that clearly doesn't make sense. So, again, it's hard to tell a machine what the right thing to do is. And so it really does take human inspection to figure out what was the intention and whether that intention is valid. All right, so the only sort of like machine implementable problem or the machine implementable uh, approach here is 
to look at the max and min, the distribution, the variable type, so I didn't like, do these make sense? And then as I advertised in the notebooks, um, looking for the number of unique entries per column can also reveal some information. So I would recommend using that function. Okay, and the last sort of numerical observation I'll make for, for sanity checking is like, some things should op oscillate in time and others should not. So an example of this is like from your day to night, your temperature should swing, right? And, and that should be on a regular basis of 24 hours. If it's on say 22 hour schedule, then maybe there's something wrong. But there are values that should change in time. And if they're not changing, you should ask why not. Okay, so we're gonna try this activity as a group chat and we'll see how well that works. Uh, I think if we used microphones, we'd have everybody talking over each other. So we're gonna stick to chat for this one. So the question is four text entries, what sort of sanity checks would you expect to, to encounter uh, for that? Okay, so this is your opportunity to uh, contribute via text. All right, so I'll give you uh, a few minutes. Please ask me questions. You, you certainly can hop on the mic if you want to ask a question or contribute, but uh, I think writing things down will be a little bit easier to not cause collision. So take a few minutes to think about what is it, and write, and, and write this down in the text comment field. What are the sanity checks for text? So text would be, um, let's, let's say I'm, I'm, as an example of its field, uh, I asked in the homework for you guys to uh, indicate an address, right? And so if, if I ask for an address, that's a text um, field, and how would you know whether or not that text field was consistent with being an address, right? Or another example of text would be a name. So if I, if I gave you a name, how would you go about figuring out whether it's a reasonable name? Right, so so the DJ's point length of string would be a good check, right? So if, if my if my if if the name that I give you has more than a thousand characters, that's probably not a name. Right? And uh, let's see. So on, on Alex's point. Let's say that you had a, a case in the check. Mm. Yeah, so city names, right, and like personal names, those should start with uppercase. So that might give you an indicator. Yeah, unusual, like Dana and, and DJ are saying, unusual symbols, huge, right? Like if my name has the pollen symbol in it, it's probably not a name in the normal sense. Separating spaces, right? If, if, if I ask you for a first and last name and you give me something with no spaces in it, it's probably not a first and last name. Yep. <laughs> Human names typically don't start with a space. That's a good one, Sophia, thank you. So I, I think you're getting the role of it, right? So like for on a given string, <laughs> there are definitely ways to check what makes sense as a string, right? So let's let's go back and I'm gonna, you're gonna keep typing, but I'm gonna figure out, uh, let's see, your, yeah. 
All right, so let's get some examples here. So, so for an example on the street address, which I think we brought up, like if there's an at symbol in the first, um, you know, word, that's probably not an actual an address. And, and names, again, typically don't contain symbols other than hyphen or space. And, and, and you can get things that, like, make sense in the wrong context, right? So, like, if I look at a set of names where the first one is Buck and Robert and Four Foot Cable and Cindy, this actually may make sense, right, as a name for something, but not in the context of these other ones. And so <laughs> Four Foot Cable is a name in a different column, right? And that, that's like the confusion of figuring out, did someone put something in the wrong column? Or did they really get confused and think that the person's name was four foot cable? Same same sort of thing shows up. Like I we got I got four hundred and fifty one yeses, thirty nine uh, no's, and two cats. Right, and so someone put the word cat in the wrong column. Right, so again you can sort of pick things out that would make sense as text, and they're capitalized correctly but they're in the wrong column, right? So like I've got Missouri, Wisconsin, and Mexico. Well, did they mean the country of Mexico or the state New Mexico? And this is a <laughs> depressingly common issue of like, you almost got it right, it's still wrong. <laughs> All right, and like if, if your unique values in the list of days is nine, then we've got some else on. Uh, improper formatting, right? So, like, if, if I give you something that I think is JSON, but it's actually XML, that'll cause confusion uh, because you're expecting JSON. Um, so, so these are just examples of where text has all of the similar, a totally different set of issues, but like the same sort of confusion on sanity checks. All right. So, there's a lot of reasons why these show up in your data. And it does, in some sense, matter the cause of the error. So, because if you can trace it down to say what caused this error, then you can start answering: Is it fixable, right? And and what would be the appropriate fix? And so, if if I have a a sampling error in my data, then interpolation may or may not be correct. Or, like this is my favorite: like this is a thing that actually is correct. It's not an error. And you should figure out like the new insight that you're going to gain from understanding it. So it's really important not to just throw away data that doesn't fit your understanding. You may actually need to go out and fix your understanding. More often, though, it's like data entry errors. All right. So you can, like I said, you can fix things. That's like the one major approach. The other is to go talk to people. This is to me vastly underrated. Like you should definitely go talk to people because your understanding is almost always incomplete. And so by talking to people, right, that's an investment of your time, you're actually going to gain an understanding of the of the content. All right. <laughs> All right. So we had uh, the data collection uh, as a source of, of cleaning up. The other observation is that. Cleaning up your data, you should be on guard for patterns because fixing one thing like that may be just an issue to fix, but if you look for more than one of them, it may actually be a pattern. And so, uh, always be on the lookout for for things that are going on in your data. And then those last two points here are important: that you shouldn't just fix your problem; you should actually document what it is that you did and tell your customers because your customers may may respond with. Well, that was the wrong fix, or oh, we didn't even know that it did, right? And so, like, you should definitely always tell people what changes you've made to the data to support your analysis. So that's that's an important sort of aspect of it's not just on you to fix your data; you have to tell the people that you fixed your data. Right. So, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with your data, so you have to be on guard for a lot of these issues of. Like the, the max and min values, and are they sensical or are there unusual values, right? All of these different aspects, there's, there, there are checklists that can help you sort of walk through the data cleaning process, but which, check, which items on the checklist are relevant almost always depends on the data set you're looking at. So develop a very generic checklist, but then 
for any given problem, it might not apply to your problem that you're looking at. Okay, uh, so that was sanity checks. The next one is on anom anomalies. Uh, let's see. 1046. I think, and we'll do anomalies and then we'll take a, a, I'm not even sure. Let's see. So we've got, let's see. Yeah, perhaps we should take a, a five minute break here. Let's make it, we'll come back at nine, at 8.50. Sorry. So that'll give us uh, a few minute break here and then we'll come back. All right, got about 20 slides left, so I think we'll finish a little bit early today, and that'll be a, a good thing. All right, so anomalies, uh, my next section. These are a little bit more esoteric, so um, I'm not expecting that you'll be applying these all the time, but they're useful techniques if you're really confused as to whether your data is what it is what it claims to be. So this this first one, um, if you haven't heard of it, don't feel bad. It's uh, something you probably won't incur you you won't encounter unless you're doing like text analysis of written documents or voice content. And so the the core idea here is called Zipf's law. 
And so this is about counting the frequency of words in text. Okay, so we're going to switch over to a notebook here. Uh, this is using a set of essays generated by students. Uh, yeah. So if I run all these. So I have a pickle file that in that oops. that no. Oh, you know what? I renamed the directories. It's week three. Okay. So I have a, uh, a, a pickle containing a bunch of essays that were written by students. And so I can count all of the words in those essays. And so all of this text here, I'm just going to skip over a lot of it. It's, it's splitting all the words on spaces and then doing a bunch of cleanup on that. So the cleanup is basically to convert um, characters to lowercase um, and then get rid of all the non-standard characters. So I'm getting rid of the punctuation here. And now what I'm left with is a list of 1,400 unique words. Uh, yeah, and then I can say like, well, what's the most frequent word? Not surprisingly, it's the word the. And so I can get back, uh, doing a bunch of fancy Python stuff, get back a list of all the words ordered by their frequency of appearance. So not surprisingly, in a set of essays about data science, the word data is number two, and it occurs less frequently than the word the. And so I can do all the more math here, and I can get, out, get rid of stop words. So stop words are words that don't contribute a lot of meaning. So like the words the and of and to and a, in, is, those are really common, but they're not the things that are very meaningful. So I'm going to take out all those common stop words, and I'm left, left with a bunch of words that are hopefully a little bit more relevant to us. So data and science and Python and statistics. And then I can say, well, what's the histogram of that distribution? So like if I could say there's uh, 296 of these, 146 of these, there's a histogram per, uh, there's a number of times that each word occurs. And if I put that on the right scale, which is a log, log scale, it turns out to be a straight line here. So I skipped over a bunch of Python, and now I'm just skipping over a bunch of math. But the point here is that if your distribution of word frequencies conforms to this behavior, then we can claim that it contains information. So that is the point of this whole notebook, is to say, like, if you have uh, data that has a straight line on a log-log curve, then it is likely that it contains information. That's all it says. And that's useful to differentiate words, or sorry, things that you think contain words that are meaningful, like uh, handwritten essays, versus uh, a bunch of text which is somewhat meaningless and, and not actually written by humans, right? And so this is a tool that you won't commonly use because you don't commonly worry about whether or not uh, a set of documents were generated by humans or ma by machines, but this is a, a, a test that we can apply that distinguishes between those two sets of information. As well, that's that's what the point of that test is. That 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 exists. You can distinguish text from gibberish without even reading the content, which is good because if you only have five essays, you can totally read the five essays. But if you have a thousand essays, reading through those to figure out whether they're gibberish or not is is hard. Okay, so we just covered words. The other sort of similar idea is that there's a distribution of letters in text. So I'm going to look at a, a distribution here in a notebook based on that same set of essays. So the, the distribution of words tells us whether or not it's containing gibberish. And then we can look at the distribution of letters to figure out which language it is. Okay, so I'm going to take that same set of documents, 
clean it up again. And here, now I'm looking just at the characters, and so I can like count the number of occurrences. I have like, a question coming in, maybe. Mm, no. ah, we have a student in the book. All right. So the I can count how many occurrences of each letter there are, and that's sort of like uh, no one cares, right? But if you order it, and this is some fancy Python to say I'm going to order the uh, the frequency of the letters, there's this shape. And this shape of distribution of letters ordered from most frequent to least frequent, this looks reasonable, right? We have a lot of E's and a lot of T's and A and I and S. So those are really frequent. And the other letters are less frequent. Well, so what, right? The point here is every language has a, dis a known distribution for the set of characters. And so you could detect, you know, which language is this potentially based on the letters that are showing up in that uh, in that data. Okay, so that is more explicitly sort of like talked about on this letter frequency Wikipedia entry. So it's kind of interesting, but um, basically we we rediscovered this distribution of letters because this is the distribution for English. Okay, so. All of the other different languages here are given on the Wikipedia page. So that's sort of cool, right? We can search by, uh, by Spanish, or it's sort by that, and get the, the right the distribution back. So again, it would tell you whether your set of documents is in a, a language or another. OK, so we just gave you two examples of word distribution and letter distribution. There's another trick that applies to numbers. And the the idea here is called Benford's Law. And, and this one is, again, probably not going to show up in your day-to-day -day data science practice, but a good thing to know about. Because if someone's forging numbers and like making data, it would be revealed by the, the Benford uh, Law analysis. Okay, so I'm going to go over to that, back to that loan data. So, Switching between data sets here. Look at then for analysis. Okay, so I'm going to load up this data and we'll reset on all cells. Okay, so we'll drop all the empty columns. The, if this notebook does not show it, I'll be a little embarrassed. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. So ignoring all that other stuff that I should get rid of, there is an analysis of which um, numbers show up most frequently in the column for loan amount. And so if you were looking for uh, values that would indicate that the numbers were randomly generated, this is where you would look. Uh, so the number one here occurs most frequently in the loan amount. And that is what Benford's law predicts, is that leading digits in your, uh, in your sequence of values should be lower. So one shows up most frequently, two shows up uh, also uh, more frequently than other numbers. So that's in accordance with Benford's law. I'll clean up this notebook later, but the uh, point there is that you can detect whether or not the number the, the numbers in your data seem realistic. Okay. So again, this isn't something that you would apply day to day, but it's good to know that there are sort of text and numeric uh, analysis that you can do to figure out whether there's whether your data is having something sort of like fraud detection or what language. It is so things you typically don't need to do, but it's available. That's it. This one. Okay, so the last section before we get to the homework is outliers. Outliers basically is the idea that you have something that you would define as normal, and there's something that is not normal. So that's uh, relatively straightforward. There's a bunch of statistical tests to detect outliers, but the, the essential idea is. 
if you have something that's that's considered reasonable and good and has been seen before, and then you and then when it exceeds that, right in the time series, maybe it's the the values that you didn't expect or they're not maybe safe, right? And, and this is the thing that you're sort of looking for is like when do they go outside the norm if it's the time series or when are they not in the range of normal values? So again, going back to another example of time series, uh, if, if, if you just have data that's supposed to be flat, it's relatively straightforward in a time series to pick out what anomalous means. It's a little harder here. What normal is depends on time, right? So like here we have something like a seasonal effect and you need to figure out, is it deviating from our previously established seasonal effect? And so there's a whole sequence of, uh, there's a whole set of attacks that you can do on this type of data. Again, we probably won't see too much of it in this class, but once you go off into the real world, like a 24 hour cycle or monthly cycles are something that you'll see more um, with real data. All right, so typically with either of these cases where you're looking for some sort of outlier or something a little bit more complicated, the, the goal is to figure out whether you should take action based on it, right? You either want to remove the data or to say, like, this is anomalous, right? Identify it. That's the, the whole goal. But you want to communicate that with your customer about what it is that you did. So. That's re-emphasizing a point I'll make a few times in this lecture. The other thing that you can do uh, besides removing, so in this example, we maybe you just want to like throw away the data that doesn't fit us, our story, or we want to send an alert on it. Or a third choice, we want to smooth that data to tell the story more clearly. So when, when would we smooth data? Well, we want to do that if it doesn't throw away the essential story being told. So an example here is if this data was um, something that we knew the reason for it and it wasn't like the major focus for us, if we showed this to our customer, they'd be like, what's going on here? Right? So to immediately distract the user uh, who we're telling the story to. So smoothing can sort of uh, discard the data points or get, eliminate the, the, the story that we don't want to tell. The challenge there is figuring out like where is that subjective analysis of what is smoothing and what is like discarding the actual essential data. So that's uh, a, <laughs> this chart makes it seem like it's a very clear story of like if you throw away too much you're wrong. <coughs> but it is dependent on the story that you're telling. Because you want to tell a story that gets to the point quickly and is not distracted by some outliers. But uh, doing that uh, effectively is, is a tricky job. So, All right. so to get to the homework, this is s somewhat more based on the week two use of beautiful soup. So I'm going to hand you. No, sorry. So I should ask before we get into the homework. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. So. All right. So we'll go over the the homework. It's basically I'm going to give you an XML file. You're going to extract from the XML file HTML code. So from that HTML, there's a set of links. And you'll want to count how many links are in each HTML page. So this is uh, you can you can use beautiful soup. That's my recommendation. And my recommendation to you is that you should break that into steps about <laughs> what it is you're going to do. So I'm not going to force you to sit through and, and do that right now, but that's an approach of designing your solution that I'll advocate rather than just sitting down to write code. All right, so I'll send you this uh, as an assignment. And then my mm, parting thought, I guess, is to, is to point out that you're going to have multiple things going on, right? You'll have an assignment and for this extracting HTML from XML. 
and you're going to have the uh, project that'll be a presentation next week. So my suggestion to you is that this is normal. You'll have multiple things going on at once, and not to be able to. There's a skill set, right, associated with juggling projects, of switching between things, um, keeping track of multiple projects at once, uh, and that's a skill set in and of itself that I can't teach other than through forcing experience upon you. So the way to be successful is just talk um, and ask questions uh, for those projects on an ongoing basis. March 6, is that what I mean? Did I? Let's see. So Dorian's question is, when is that? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, let's see, I have to check my schedule because. So the homework is due. This week's homework is due next Tuesday. I'm gonna verify the date on the on the presentation. Is that what I, this is a question of self consistency. Uh, to answer Alex's question, uh, I have provided feedback uh, on the proposals that were for the projects uh, via Blackboard today. So those. Uh, I, only a few people who submitted their proposal, I gave some feedback that they should check in more with me. But for the most part, everyone has uh, received a notice that they should proceed. And let's come back to answer the scheduling question. Yeah. So. That's consistent, at least from last week uh, and this week, is that project presentations are on the 27th of February. Oops, does it? Let me check my syllabus then. Yeah, so if my syllabus is different, I defer to my syllabus. All right. Uh, yes, looks like my my slide presentations and my syllabus are not synchronized, so I'm going to defer to my syllabus. It should be March 6th. Apologize for causing the excitement there. <laughs> 